Mr. Ugas, um, co corruption fight is a huge thing in Ukraine, in a lot of post-authoritarian societies here in Eastern Europe, uh, but now we are at the stage um, of uh, creating a lot of anti-corruption institutions, from prosecutor office to the anti-corruption court. Um, to what extent do you think this is the way forward to create a separate institutions? Uh, how, make, how to make them efficient, because they are vulnerable, and how long does it really, you think, takes in order they are efficient? Well, first of all, cor corruption, and specifically grand corruption, is a problem for the world, not only for Ukraine. Two-thirds of the world, according to the Corruption Perception Index, are seriously affected uh, of grand corruption. If you see what's happening right now in Latin America, you'll see that most of our countries in South America are uh, quite in, in, uh, in major crisis, crisis because of issues related to corruption. In this country, after the Maiden Revolution, several institutions were created in order to fight corruption. And of course, after Yanukovych and all what you have experienced dur during that regime, it was necessary to create an infrastructure to tackle grand corruption. That's why the NABU is created, the SAPO, uh, the Prosecutor General's Office uh, tried to focus on anti-corruption, and now you have the anti-corruption high court and other institutions around them. Uh, the problem is that it is not enough to create infrastructure. You need to put there a lot of political will, and it is clear then that in the former regime of Mr. Poroshenko, there was no political will to make effective uh, these anti-corruption measures and policy. I remember I had a conversation with uh, former Prosecutor General Mr. Lutsenko, uh, amazingly the only Attorney General of the world who had no legal background, and he said he was going to implement a strong anti-corruption measures, and nothing happened. It's amazing when you observe this from outside the country that there is not even one case of corruption that has matured enough in order to generate results regarding Yanukovych experience and all the other cases of corruption that have been happening in the past years. So it is not only about creating institutions, it's about allocating political will, resources, and basically to start uh, uh, enforcing the capacity of all these agencies that should coordinate among them in order to generate results. There is no uh, fixed term in which you say, okay, usually in three years, four years, five years, you will have results. In the case of my country in Peru, when we started the anti-corruption process against uh, the Fujimori's regime, we delivered results in three months. We recovered $75 million in six months and put uh, under criminal investigation 1,500 people in the first 14 months of uh, the work. But after the obtainance of all these amazing results, then nothing happened in the change of the structures, and then Peru went again to uh, levels, very heavy levels of grand corruption. 19 years after that experience, now the prosecutors that are fighting corruption in my country in these times are taking advantage of what happened 19 years ago. So my experience is that uh, in order to obtain sustainable results, you can obtain immediate results if there's political will, and I can say that in, in very few months you can put some of the big powerful actors of corruption in front of justice. And maybe you can obtain convictions also within one year, a year and a half, maybe two years. But I would say that to obtain sustainable, achievable results, uh, this is a process of accumulation of experiences. So the Peruvian prosecutors of 2019 are making effective results, building on what we did in the 2000, 2002, 2004, uh, 15 years ago. At the same time, you know, I want to, of course, ask about the Ukrainian institutions, but to follow up uh, what, you sp what you were speaking about your own country, still it feels like that you have the case against uh, Mr. Fujimori. And now, recently, there was a case against his daughter, who created the party, which somehow looks 
maybe for the people creates an idea of the impunity of the doesn't matter that the politicians is there still in a public opinion you know the people around that still kind of claim that they are not corrupt they create their own parties and um, say that these are the political persecutions so you said that there is a good result but at the same time, if you look now, you're saying, like, oh, again, Fujimori daughter, or again, uh, anti-corruption scandal. So how do you really think it takes for the society to, to really solve that? First of all, there is no political candidate that doesn't speak about fighting corruption. That's typical. There is no corrupt political leader that doesn't say he is a political persecuted person. So this is nothing new. The second thing is that you are not going to solve systemic corruption from criminal justice. You can prosecute, investigate, and convict the responsible of those crimes. Fujimori right now is in prison paying 25 years, uh, uh, like Montesinos, like many of the leaders of his criminal network. But we don't have the illusion that we are going to change the problem of corruption in Peru, putting people in prison. Because our corruption, like yours, is systemic. It's structural. It's not a problem of one party or two or three bad leaders or bad politicians. If we don't change our structural justice system, if we don't change the way we educate our people, if we don't change the way we make business, we invest in infrastructure, in the way we have access to the decision-making processes, you can put a lot of people in prison, but new people will come over them. and again, will be involved in corrupt practices. So the criminal justice plays a role, and that role is to avoid impunity and to sanction those who have committed crimes. But if you don't solve a previous situation, there are those structural problems, and you will need to ask yourself, where are the structural problems of Ukraine that generate constantly grand corruption actors on the field? And why, in the past decades, all the leaders of this country have been taking money and uh, generating corrupt schemes. Most of them are still under impunity. We'll see if the new institutions will start breaking that impunity tradition in Ukraine. But the problem is not just breaking impunity. The problem is solving the structural problems that generate corruption uh, from the system itself. Still, to be more precise, you were following some of our um, anti-corruption institutions. So how do you assess, for instance, the court? It's very recent. It had been opened early September. But at the same time, for instance, NABU or Special Prosecutor, um, Anti-Corruption Prosecutor Office was there. There were some controver controversies. There is also the case when you think that the Nazar law enforcement agencies are competing uh, with anti-corruption agencies and that they are also the part of the system which doesn't let them develop. I think it's been a very good start the way the new judges of the high anti-corruption court have been appointed. It has been a transparent process with the intervention of international actors, neutral actors, selecting the best candidates for this task. So I think that's a very good start. Now we need to see if the judges are going to accomplish uh, the task, the very delicate task they have on their hands. On the other hand, what we've been observing regarding the institutions created in Ukraine in the past years in order to confront corruption, we had several problems there. We had a prosecutor general that was politically appointed and tainted and had no political will to promote investigations. Then you had NABU not speaking with SAPO, and they were competing in order to reserve their own quotas of power. Uh, NABU complaining that they were doing the investigations, but nothing happened once those investigations arrived to a prosecutor's office. And some of the prosecutors saying that they were promoting uh, their own uh, investigations, but nothing happened when they arrived to the judiciary. So if you don't have a system that talks within itself, if agencies don't talk and don't share their responsibilities according to uh, the mission they have in the entire system, of course nothing is going to happen. While the corrupt are all the time coordinating and talking among them and have a lot of flexibility, then we find all these uh, institutions within the states, and this is not only a problem of Ukraine, of, co of, Ukraine, of course, but you see a state that 
has institutions that are isolated, that do not coordinate, that do not cooperate among them, and of course then the corrupt will win the battle. At this stage, is it too early for you, for instance, to look at the new government, uh, the ideas or the first steps? Well, uh, in the hours I've been in the country, I think this is the tenth time I am, I am asked uh, with, uh, to respond to this question. And my, my answer is, it's too soon to know. I think there are some good uh, beginnings. Uh, the anti-corruption speech and motivation expressed by the president is a good start. What happened with the high anti-corruption court, I think, is also a good start. The profile of the prosecutor general, I just had a meeting with him this afternoon, and what he expresses, uh, I think, brings hope that things are going to start to change, but we need to see what happens in reality. They need to deliver results. If they don't start frying some big fish, generating some uh, transparent, and, and legal processes against the corrupt and obtaining some convictions of those that clearly have been involved in grand corruption cases, they will not recover the trust of the public. And citizens right now do not believe in their institutions because they have been defrauded for many years. At the same time, you mentioned that any uh, often corrupt officials say this is a political uh, persecution against them. That's not a new thing. However, I feel it still a bit concerning when in particular the people close to the previous regime are often to be the first to be targeted and or for, for instance those who are in the oppositions how you um, in in your case in case of your fight against uh, corruption in peru you said like there were 1500 people uh, persecuted in very very short term um, but how you really see this difference between the, you know, whether there is some point of the selective justice, when, you, you, when, when the government go after those who were their political opponents or are their current or potential political opponents. That's and a they risk. could be corrupt. Uh, and they that, could be that, corrupt. That's a real risk. When the investigations and the prosecutions are triggered by the executive, by the political branch of government, but supposedly, the Prosecutor General, the NABU, and the SAPO are independent institutions. They don't obey instructions from the new government. And I hope that the new Prosecutor General will not be uh, politically manipulated by the interest of this government. In my case, in Peru, I was appointed to investigate Montesinos, and 11 days after our, our appointment, we opened an investigation against the president that appointed us, that is Fujimori. And right now, the attorney general's office in my country is prosecuting the four last former presidents of Peru, all of them from different political parties. So you have Mr. Humala, Mr. Toledo, Garcia that killed himself in order to avoid a criminal investigation for corruption, and Mr. Kuczynski. Nobody can say in that case <laughs> that there is a political motivation in the investigations of corruption. The problem is that almost all the politicians that arrive to high level positions in countries like mine, and I assume also something similar happens in Ukraine, get involved in corrupt practices. That is not a fault of the prosecutors. They need to be investigated. And the thing here is that due process of law must be in place in order to avoid these uh, 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 speeches of saying we are politically persecuted and this is just a, a, a hunt, a political hunt against the opponents of the, of the government. Still, do you uh, think that currently uh, we also see that um, some of the new, let's say, people do use different word, but some, let's say, populistic uh, parties or politicians are running campaigns with the anti-corruption agenda. And among them, there are quite dubious people. You know, Trump ran with the uh, anti-corruption agenda. Uh, Bolsonaro was speaking about anti-corruption agenda. The parties which are, let's say, with some authoritarian trend in Eastern Europe, they are all having this agenda. It was always the fight of the corruption was there, but probably now it just sounds more, um, you know, present for the more general public. Like, so how do you see the 
um, how we can work with this narrative because in, in many, many recent cases, like Brexit was done with the idea that, you know, like there are corrupt officials. Uh, drain the swamp, there is a phrase which is used. And we know how this phrase is misused in order like to, to work with the, uh, with the establishment. How the people who were genuinely in the anti-corruption movement can maybe shape this narrative and not to make, let it to be hijacked, let's say. It is absolutely true, and I said it before, that there's no candidate in these times that doesn't uh, center their campaign with an anti-corruption speech. Why? Because anti-corruption is profitable, politically talking. Uh, like eradication of poverty, inequality, uh, generating uh, labor positions, work for the people, of course this is profitable. And the politicians know, the candidates know this, and they, of course, get into these populist offers of trying to sell a product of their profile as candidate, the one that is going to fight and, and defeat corruption. Uh, it is possible to try to clean the agenda of the candidates if we, first of all, have uh, enough information of who that candidate is, where is he or she coming from. Uh, the problem is that in our political campaigns, we are not always uh, uh, aware of the information regarding some specific candidate. So I think that the first obligation of a citizen that is going to vote is to try to know who is the person that is offering all these things. And for civil society organizations like Transparency International Ukraine or others involved in the mission of combating corruption, there is the obligation to try to monitor all these candidates, to try to acquire information and put this information in the public domain so people know where are these people coming from. I can assure you that if you investigate the candidates in very little time, in weeks probably, you will know who are they, where are they coming from, what they did in before, uh, before they were candidates in the positions they had, and many of them will have severe doubts and suspicions of being people involved or linked to corruption, to organized crime, and uh, other negative things. In Ukraine, and it's not just the only country in the region, uh, one of the hugest issue is uh, oligarchy which is a system uh, which is, uh, of course, it's something, it's the part of the corruption, and corruption is a part of the oligarchy. However, uh, big monopolies were created some time ago, maybe decades ago. At the same time, we know that maybe some companies were privatized in a not a very transparent and in quite a dubious way. However, these are already big, big companies. And foreign investors are extremely uh, cautious also about the uh, <coughs> rights of the uh, private property or and like any kind of the big change in the ownership of these companies or, um, you know, everybody speaks that you need to fight oligarchy. But at the same time, if are those three or four biggest businessmen in the country with the huge companies uh, working with the Western companies, that could be considered as like a disruption for the market. And there is, we can't really find the way how you really fight monopoly, you know, like, where you can freeze, where you can have kind of, a, I don't know, like a starting point from zero that you don't investigate the former crimes, for instance, or just say like, we're starting from the scratch at this point. Uh, how do you think that you can both uh, fight oligarchy, fight corruption, but at the same time not to make the foreign investor panic? Well, impunity is a very negative factor. And it doesn't matter if it's impunity now or if it was impunity 10 years ago. I would say the only limitation that probably you will have to investigate corruption and sanction corruption from the past is the legal limitation. If statute of limitations already happened, then you cannot go after these people. But in many of the fortunes of our countries, you will find at the beginning the implementation of corrupt practices. That's how they made many of these people, not all of them, but many of them made their fortunes with unlawful uh, practices. And that cannot be forbidden. Not can, that needs to be addressed in order to try to generate for the future a clean environment of how to do business in our countries. 
Because a company that is tainted and is on the hands of an oligarch or someone that is used to corrupt practices or trying to influence or uh, act on monopolic uh, activities in the market, for sure you will have a corrupt environment in general in the business sector. So it is necessarily also for the private sector to try to do their effort in order to change the rules of doing business and try to eradicate all those old practices linked to corruption or to uh, different practices that affect a free market that is basically with access to information and transparency, the assurance of a positive way out. But what would be your opinion that to say like, look, those people who've done something wrong in the 90s, unless they do something wrong now, you know, with the new practices, let's leave them with what they have already. Well, as I said, if there are no legal consequences and statute of limi limitations already operated, okay. Now we want to see the way they are going to conduct their businesses now. And we need to monitor that and be very careful because there's also a very common practice in countries like ours saying, oh, wow, this is such a big company, such a big entrepreneur that we cannot touch them. And we've seen many, many times these people abusing of their power, of their influence, of conflict of interest. Maybe they are not bribing directly a public official, but they are abusing of their position in order to <laughs> obtain some favors from the system. So conflict of interest, lobbying, and other practices that are on the gray zone need to be addressed and monitored in order to uh, impede the commission of corrupt practices and abuses of market. In the case, uh, recently now Ukraine is on the front pages of the American and global media uh, due to the phone between the President Zelensky <coughs> and President Trump. Uh, do you find the whole case, for instance, of this quid pro quo, how they say uh, in the US legislation that the uh, military aid could be withdrawn for the political investigation in, in another country as a case of corruption? Well, uh, if you go to the formal definition of corruption, corruption is the abuse of uh, power in order to obtain a personal gain. And we would need, of course, corruption is much more than that definition. There are many features of corruption uh, uh, and the complexity of the phenomenon make it, make it very difficult to define. But uh, I would say, first of all, we need, in this affair between Trump and the new president of Ukraine, we need to to be clear of the political consequences of this relation, I think something is going to uh, be produced and evidence is going to be collected in the process of the uh, United States political system. And then we will have more clarity of what was happening there. If there was a, an unlawful way of obtaining favors that is going to generate individual benefit for some of the actors, then we definitely will be uh, in front of an undue practice and probably a corrupt practice. And for instance, again, Mr. Uh, Trump himself tried to play that, you know, the son of President Biden was corrupt being in the board of the Ukrainian company, which in fact, we would admit in quite a dubious past before uh, 12, 14, before Biden was there. And legally, it looks like the, uh, he got his money for what he was doing and it could be in the board. But think from generally, like to what extent it's questionable to have, uh, um, you know, like the son of the vice president of the big country being in the board of the company. Like, is it like the trade of the name? Again, it depends. First of all, what does a president of the United States has to do calling the president of Ukraine yeah. to try to motivate an investigation in this country? I mean, that's absolutely improper, at least improper, and probably corrupt. There, some people are talking about extortion. If you don't investigate this guy, then my aid to your country will be compromised. So that, that's a first questionable thing. On the other hand, the position of the son of Biden in a Ukrainian company 
can be investigated, and I assume authorities here are going to investigate this seriously without the pressure of Trump or the United States. If there are allegations that this guy has been involved in corrupt practices, there is no reason not to investigate him. So if that investigation is neutral, it's uh, proper, and with the guarantees of due process, of course it must move forward. And still, um, I would probably need to add again and again that in, in case of the Hunter Biden, there is nothing uh, he was involved. It is the issue of the company uh, had the uh, problems and had been the allegation of um, not the not not the, uh, re the, the, the receiving the licenses uh, from the Ministry uh, of Environment uh, in before 2014. So it was before uh, Hunter Biden. But generally, you know what this scandal also show us. Uh, we're looking now at, at a lot of transcript. Maybe you don't read that that detailed as the Ukrainians. That there is a lot involved in the high level of the American politics from the beginning. That now you have the. President Trump's uh, inner circle, like from kids being also involved in the business. It's also for some people is dubious, but as well that it's not really the, th there is a political pressure. And it feels like the, how, how do you think how it influenced the global discussion of the corruption and for instance, the role of the United States as the country which, for instance, in many countries uh, was, the government of the U.S. was speaking about the rule of law. There were a lot of international programs, uh, finance in order to build a rule of law in different countries or create anti-corruption institutions. And at the same time, we currently see that the inner circle of President Trump uh, could be questionable. Mr. Giuliani, there are a lot of questions to him and the people around. How do you think it impacts this, you know, trade, this help, this aid? for the anti-corruption uh, in Ukraine, its legitimacy, its uh, ethics, and the influence of you know, this kind of scandal on you know, moral, uh, let's say, right and legitimacy of, of such a big country. First of all, United States is not the best example of a political system. Their campaigns are all tainted of different interests in the financing of the campaigns. And it's been a problem for years. Nothing has been done because uh, there are huge, there is huge resistance from the political parties and the political actors to clean and make transparent the way they finance their campaigns. And in the case of Trump, with all the noise and allegations of corruption around him and the people that is around him too, uh, uh, of course generates more suspicions of how clean and how legitimate are his interests in running the country. You have to talk to many of American actors and they are very critical of the situation of Trump. Uh, the second thing is in these issues, there are what we call PEPs, political exposed persons. And PEPs, political exposed persons like the son of Biden, Biden himself, Trump, and other people that are relevant for the public opinion and for the public interest, they have to conduct themselves with more uh, accurate uh, uh, care in order not to incur in situ improper situations. So uh, this is a very difficult affair because it involves politicians, two countries, sovereignty, and different rules in each country in order to, to process the situation. Uh, I think situations like this need to be avoided. And since we are talking about PEPs in both sides, there must be thorough investigations in order to try to establish if proper rules have been broken. How do you think in the recent years there is more corruption globally or we just hear more because it's more exposed. There are more anti-corruption movement because you know generally people think like the things getting worse. But if you look, you see like hmm, weren't corruption in the 20th century? How do you or are other countries becoming more corrupt? Or you just think like we are talking more about that? Well, you will find both positions in the public debate. People that say, no, no, it's the same corruption we had 30 years ago, but now because it's more visible, communications, etc., uh, we are hearing more about it. I personally believe that we are having more corruption, and this is because there is more money over the table. Uh, all the technology 
and the financial systems and all the enablers that are around the financial system make more easy to take money and move it assets or resources from one place to another. You, you've seen what happened with the Panama Papers or the Paradise Papers. 72 heads of states were involved in the Panama Papers scheme with offshore companies that were moving dirty money from one place to another to pay bribes, to evade taxation, to help uh, organize crime, uh, uh, diamonds, trafficking or human trafficking or drug trafficking. That didn't happen 50 years ago. Uh, now you have many financial instruments that make easier uh, the commission of different crimes with difficult uh, possibilities of following the money. All these paradises we find around the world where you can hide money with very sophisticated systems make it more difficult to trace. Look what happened also with the Lava Jato case, a car wash uh, affair that started in Brazil and had negative impact in 12 countries of Latin America. Only one company, Odebrecht, had a department within the structure of the company to manage the bribes they were paying all around the region. And they had four layers of offshore companies to move the money without the possibility of being identified. Those mechanisms didn't exist 30 years ago. So I think this has triggered the uh, capacity of impact of grant corruption. At the same time, uh, not all is negative. Also because of we are living in a global world with online communications, internet, etc., there are some lights too. There, are, there is more capacity to investigate, to make uh, a follow-up of all these actions, the coordination between the countries, uh, the possibility now with the United Nations Convention Against Corruption or the OECD or the World Bank or the IMF that has a very significant role in Ukraine. Now the IMF is talking about corruption and conditionality in order to observe how the actors are going to move regarding uh, corruption. So all these are new elements that uh, are on the debate of the fight against corruption. And one very significant that is playing a role in many countries of the world is people mobilization. Ten years ago, nobody went to the streets against corruption. After the Arab Spring, you've seen how the people are going to the streets by millions. And in some cases, they have obtained these mobilizations, amazing results. The prime minister of South Korea had to resign. In Romania, they stopped after a 1.5 million demonstration people. They stopped a draft law that intended to legalize bribes under 10,000 euros. The situation in Brazil with Lava Jato, more than 3 million people to the streets. In Guatemala, for months, the people went on the public demonstrations until the former president went to prison. So citizens now are also positive actors in these processes against corruption. And after the uh, Panama Papers or Party Papers uh, revelation, um, have you seen and observed more political will, in particular from the uh, big important countries to do something with offshore uh, um, tax havens and money laundering in real. You know, there were some things happened in the UK, but in real. In some cases, yes. But in most of these cases, it's because of the pressure of the citizens. Organized uh, citizens like Transparency International, for example. Transparency International went to the G20 in Australia in 2014 and put on the debate the, necessi the necessity of implementing uh, a register to know who are the ultimate beneficiaries of offshores. This debate started in 2014. In 2016, Cameron called to a summit in London and there 12 countries registered themselves in order to uh, put in place that register. Right now there are seven countries that have that register in place. So this takes time. As I said before, this is a result of accumulative processes. And I think that because the demands of the citizens and organized civil society, some of the leaders of the world and the big institutions are given some space in order to make possible the implementations of better controls against corruption. 
the same time, in particular in these countries, there are a couple of other uh, states uh, mentioned as like a positive result, uh, but maybe you would elaborate more, for instance, of the anti-corruption fight. So, for instance, sometimes Singapore is explained as an example. However, we know it's not the, let's say, best de democracy if you speak about the, the, the other freedom. So, of course, I, but, but there is a, like this myth that it's the country with a low level of corruption. How will you, you assess that? Uh, we know that there is a very high level of corruption uh, in China. But there are also a lot of political cases uh, against some party members uh, where, of course, people might be sentenced to death even for the corruption case. But it's in, in, in societies like ours, sometimes is uh, said as if it's an example. What do you think about that? Well, there are different responses for different questions. Yeah. The case of Singapore, it's a city-state. It's a very small community. It's very easy to control what happens in a community like Singapore. And it is true that it's an authoritarian regime, and, uh, but they have been efficient in controlling corruption. That's, that's undeniable. But I think it has to do with the political conditions. On the other hand, you had, for example, Hong Kong. Hong Kong is not an authoritarian regime, and they were very successful uh, curbing corruption 40 years ago when the scandal of the police started there. You have Botswana in Africa. Uh, after three different administrations, they have been able to reduce corruption amazingly, and they are in a very good shape on the situation of integrity and transparency. The case of China is, is different. Uh, in, some weeks ago, they found one Chinese with $40 billion in his personal account and 13 uh, uh, pounds of gold in his house. Uh, one Chinese, $40 billion. In the past, after the China leaks, 20 members of parliament had in their accounts $62 billion that were taken out of China to some offshore paradises. Uh, it is my sense that there is no political will on the Chinese system to address corruption, that when these scandals arouse is because someone leaked information or clashed with the official system. But if you see some of the Chinese companies going around the world doing business, many of them are implementing corrupt practices and exporting corrupt practices to the other countries without any control or supervision of the Chinese system. So I think that uh, even though President uh, Xi, Xi Jinping in several cases have mentioned his intention to fight corruption, uh, he needs and the system needs to, to put in place more express evidence that this is going beyond a speech and the, the system is really going to confront corruption. How do you see now the situation in, in our region, in particular in Eastern Europe? We have some year, more than a year ago, the uh, events in Armenia where there was the change of the government. We, this summer, uh, the, the, the oligarch of Moldova had left the country. Um, at the same time, there are the same things happening in Azerbaijan and Russia, but how you generally see the, how the region is developing? Well, Eastern Europe has been uh, performing very lousy in corruption issues, and you have some emblematic oligarchs and corrupt actors in the region acting for decades, like in Africa, or in some Asian countries, or in some Latin American countries. Uh, and I think this is a heritage of a system, but also it has become part of the political culture <coughs> in order to allow these people to uh, uh, seize power and benefit themselves and their families uh, immensely from uh, uh, the resources of the country. So uh, some hope is coming into some of these countries, some of the ones you have mentioned. Ukraine is also one that is opening windows. That's my, that's my perception right now. There is a moment of opening windows and I think civil society and people that is really willing to generate a change have to take advantage of this opening uh, of the windows. But 
it is a responsibility of President Zelensky and his regime to demonstrate that he is really willing to generate a transformation of the structures and a real change for the country. This is the same challenge for other countries in the region too. I had a uh, chance to talk to the uh, president, former president of Estonia, Thomas Silvis, uh, and who was visiting Ukraine and was also very critical about the corruption. But when we talk, he explained that, there, for instance, in Estonian language, there are two different words for corruption. There is a word for petty corruption, but which means that you are supposed, as a citizens, for instance, to pay a bribe, a small bribe, for the service the state or somebody else need to provide you, either faster or at all, to get access. And there is this high-level corruption where um, the state uh, really, um, or, or some politicians or some people, abuse their power and enrich themselves. Um, do you think that like, this differentiation help, you know, to focus and to help the society to understand what we fight? No, I think it's a false dilemma. Corruption is corruption. You'll have petty corruption or grand corruption. Both of them have very negative impact in uh, our societies. Of course, they are of different nature. But it is very dangerous to try to explain petty corruption saying, oh, this is part of our culture. No, it's not part of the culture. There are some traditions, like in Africa, uh, there are words in order to explain the exchange of favors. In our societies in Latin America, we also have specific words in order to traditionally explain the exchange of favors. But this is not corruption. This is something different. When you try to adjust the traditional structures to explain explain what's going on with the bureaucrats, with the police that is charging someone in every corner in order to obtain some coins and, and not sanction that person. That is not a traditional practice. That is corruption. But there's a false dilemma, false dilemma from people saying, well, if we fight grand corruption, then we will forget about petty corruption. No, we have to fight both, but they have different strategies. And in this case of petty corruption, the issue has to do with this cultural challenge of moving from a culture of corruption that had been implemented for years in our societies, not because we are Peruvians are more corrupt than the, than the Finnish, it's because the way we were organizing our societies was embedded of corruption from the beginning. When the viceroys came from Spain, they generated a clientelistic way of relation, but that doesn't nothing to do doesn't have nothing to do with our DNA for being from this race or other or from this culture or other. So there's a challenge there. I always say the difference between uh, uh, corruption in Latin America, for example, and corruption in Spain, and most of our countries come from the Spanish uh, colony, is that in Spain that there's a lot of corruption in Spain, is the corruption of the elites. But the common citizen, the common Spanish citizen, doesn't imagine himself putting his hand in a pocket and taking 10 euros to bribe a policeman, or to pay a bureaucrat in order to obtain a license. It's not in the way they think. In Latin America, everybody is in the way of saying, well, this policeman is going to stop me, then I will bribe him, and I will bribe the bureaucrat in order to obtain uh, a fast license in my, in my uh, request. So uh, I think for countries like mine and many others in this world, there's a double challenge. We have to fight corruption, but we also have to fight the fact that corruption has been normalized. People believe that this is a normal way of living and moving forward. Have you heard the, um, some of the surveys or some of the ideas that, uh, for instance, there was one survey in Ukraine, I wonder you've seen it uh, yourself, somebody showed it to you, that when you ask people uh, if there is a corruption, and uh, if, if they, in particular, um, recently had uh, been either involved or had been asked for a bribe, um, they say that the, the, there, is a pr there is a smaller level of the corruption people, um, people confront rather to this general concept that they think there is a corruption in the country. Well, it's typical and it's part of a defensive psychological way of reacting. When they ask you about corruption, it's very easy to point to the other and say, well, this is, this is a corrupt guy or this government or this political party. When they ask, 
have you been involved in any corrupt practices? You immediately say, well, no. And maybe he thinks that what he's doing is not corruption, or maybe he's just lying because he seems uh, uh, shameful from himself. Uh, but if we go and look in the day-to-day -day practice of the people in many of our countries we will follow, we will find that many of them are committing corrupt, petty corrupt practices all the time because they believe it is normal. It's the way to survive in a jungle of a third world country. And can you elaborate more? We started the discussion about the uh, your work in particular as a prosecutor general yeah, in Peru. Um, I was a special state attorney. A, sp a special state attorney, yeah. So um, thanks for correct. Uh, so what was needed for you? You know, you've been hired by the former president, Fujimori. He wanted, as I understand, to get rid also of his opponent and to that you also investigate the, his opponent. And in the end, you investigated the president himself. What resources you needed? You know, how you dealt with that? Because it's also quite a dangerous thing. It looks good, like there is a hero attorney who comes and kind of, you know, kill this corrupt system. But what do you need for that? Well, first of all, Fujimori was in a big crisis because his personal advisor <coughs> appeared in a video bribing a congressman. That was the situation that triggered the crisis because the people went to the street and started demanding Fujimori to step down. And then he decided to appoint me, not to investigate his opponent, but to investigate formally his partner, Montesinos, that had flew away after the video appeared. And then we decided to go after him when we received the evidence that he was also involved, apparently, in money laundering issues and other corrupt practices. In those days, we didn't have an office. We were just appointed, and we were acting on our private offices, me and my two deputies. We didn't have a budget. We were putting of our money in order to mobilize uh, the first investigations. We were just recruiting our team so we were in a very precarious situation. But we believed, we strongly believed, me and my team, that we had a mission to accomplish in that moment. And that had to do with the future of the country. And we say, OK, this is dangerous. Of course it is dangerous. Uh, we are in a very precarious situation. <laughs> we can get in trouble. Yes, we can get in trouble, but we think we need to do this because of the future, because of our own future and our families and the people we believe uh, uh, have to develop in our country. But how such a small team can go for 1,500 people? Because we were not alone. We had the citizenship supporting our action. When we were attacked, and we were attacked several times, there were public demonstrations, like now, defending the prosecutors of these days, there were public demonstrations defending us. The independent uh, newspapers and TV programs and journalists, investigative journalists, were all the time supporting our work and informing, informing the public what was going on. So we felt that it was a historical role that we had to accomplish, and it happened. Because two weeks after we started pushing these investigations, Fujimori flew away, the regime collapsed, a transitional president came, and this was a fantastic guy. I mean, president, the, our transitional president, Paniagua, uh, he gave all the support we needed for this investigation. He gave us a budget, he gave us an office, and that's the way we could mobilize all these uh, investigations. But how would you deal, for instance, when there are the, you know, you are the prosecutors, but the courts are maybe dependent on the political elite? Of course, you can say that the pressure from the public and the citizens is important for the courts. However, do you think it's it could be enough, or what, did you have a fair trial? Say? In our case, it was it was uh, uh, unique because the entire system collapsed. So. The Attorney General had to resign. The Justices of the Supreme Court had to resign. The militaries were in panic. So the entire system collapsed. And that's when the moral reserve of the country appeared. So new judges, young judges were appointed by the provisional uh, president of the court, and the same happened in the prosecutor's office. So there was a new generation of clean people willing to do something. I understand that this is not always the case. 
I've been in many countries where there are interesting prosecutors moving forward their investigations, and once they send the investigations to the judiciary, everything stops. As it is clear that nothing is going to move or, or generate results if you still have these judges that are linked to corrupt interests or to powerful economical groups. And then, when that happens, the only way to, to make it, uh, to break this, this uh, issue, this problem, is to make it public, to denounce, to mobilize people and say, this cannot uh, be sustainable for, for much more time. We've seen how, in the case of my country again, six months ago, the attorney general who was trying to obstruct the investigations of corruption conducted by the special tax force of prosecutors was forced to resign because the people went to the streets. And they went every day to his office, thousands of people asking for his resignation. The journalists were publishing all the time all the linkages of this guy with organized crime, with other interests. So he couldn't stand that, and he had to resign. So we shouldn't underestimate the power of the citizens and the power of other allies when positive forces get together, journalists, uh, uh, I don't know, many, well, civil society organizations, of course, even some business elites that are willing to change the environment in which they make business. Uh, before, you mentioned the people coming to the streets, prior and journalists publishing the investigations, uh, we had elections this year, uh, two of them, in particular important presidential. There was a huge uh, corruption scandal regarding the uh, um, uh, military uh, in the um, defense sector about the way how the um, some details were um, bought uh, to the Ukrainian uh, military, yet some of the journalists were heavily criticized, the, the journalists who made the investigation, criticized that they're playing a political card because, um, you know, like they run the investigation before the elections. Uh, they investigated another side as well. So, you know, like you can't say that they're biased. However, there was a, even from some of the, you know, civ other civil society members, um, there was quite a huge, uh, Critics that, like, you played a card of the politicians. You played for anti-establishment card. The state is fragile and there is this anti-establishment movement and the populists are using it and this case had been used by the, uh, I don't know, like the, the other political force which didn't appreciate the success of the previous government. What would you say on that? And I, I think that that narrative is somewhere still present. It's impossible to deal with uh, confrontation of grand corruption and uh, trying to break impunity uh, traditions or inertia without receiving accusations of all types. They will say you are breaching security, national security issues, that you are mobilized uh, because of some political or business interests, that you are anti-nationalist or whatever. But when this noise appears, the first reaction I have, something good is happening because people is reacting. And in the case of Ukraine, you had two revolutions on the streets. So you know what I'm talking about. The power of the people, when the people react and organize itself, makes some good things happen. And I think that uh, regarding grand corruption, what we will see in the next years around the world is more and more people engagement in the confrontation against corruption. There is one instrument uh, which is called, I mean, it's coming from this region. Uh, we're speaking about the Magnitsky Act, uh, which had been um, adopted first in the States, then in Canada. And the idea is that using this instrument, the uh, people, uh, the corrupt people who committed some crimes, also the crimes against uh, human rights, could be, I don't know, like their accounts could be frozen in the United States or the countries which adopted this. Do you find this instrument successful and why you think like if it's there, what we talked a lot, that it could be used for a different country. It was originated from Russia. It's not just about Russia, of course. Um, as uh, to how you think you think this, this is a successful instrument or could be used more or there is something you can, you can deal differently with it? I think the Magnitsky Act is a very valuable tool. I have witnessed how much it upsets 
some of the biggest crooks of the world. Uh, the Venezuelan members of the Maduro mafia, because that's not a regime, that's a mafia that is, has generated a humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. They are really upset because they cannot go to the States. If they go, well, the visas are denied and s some other European countries are going on the same uh, direction. Their assets are being freezed and seized in the United States. So I think, and, and their names are appearing all the time on the public opinion, and they hate light over their actions. So my balance of the Magnitsky Act is a positive one. Of course, it could be dangerous if it is used for political interests. Uh, well, we need to be uh, cautious and monitor all these situations in order to denounce if there is a deviation of the positive uh, use of this type of tools. But I think that up to now, uh, for many countries that are victims of grand corruption and abuses of human rights, uh, this instrument uh, on the United States is producing very positive results. So apart from the citizens' movement, um, you're working uh, with the case of corruption. It could be very frustrating. You know, like when you every day read how corrupt this world is, it could be very disappointing. And of course, the citizens who come into the streets could be something which makes uh, you inspired. But apart from the people's movement, what maybe are the cases uh, globally, systematic cases, where things you know, worked well, and where you recent, like, where your recent inspirations? Well, there are two different approaches to this question. The first one is uh, total successes. Well, I mentioned uh, Hong Kong. I mentioned Botswana. I think those are two typical cases of how the entire system improved and, and mm, it was sustainable in the time, for many years, it is still sustainable. But then you have the other cases where small progress is achieved, and that's why I was talking about a process of accumulation. My country is a good example of that. 20 years ago, we had this vigorous, amazing anti-corruption process, and then we again went to a horrible period of grand corruption. Four former presidents, the four last presidents, are under investigation or in prison because of corruption. And now we have very interesting uh, situation where that transitional president, we have again a transitional president, has closed Congress. Uh, the people is supporting, this is a constitutional measure in our constitution, so it is, it is part of the legal system. But then there's a positive dynamic of the reforms that need to be done in order to change, finally, some of the basic problems of Peru. And this is happening. I don't know how it's going to finish, but right now, there's a lot of expectation. And this wouldn't have been possible if we wouldn't have accumulated some small progress from the past. We are not signatories of the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. We are signatories of the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption. We are signatories of the OECD Convention Against Bribery. We are part of different systems. Our foreign affairs minister is absolutely involved in all the international efforts to tackle corruption. So uh, this hasn't happened 25 years ago. Uh, so I think that we shouldn't expect huge changes in 24 hours, but I'm an optimistic guy. I, I wouldn't be doing what I do <laughs> if I wouldn't be an optimistic person. But I'm, I'm looking in, in the small progresses that together make big pieces that can finally generate grand changes. I still would probably clarify rather than question, but in the case of the um, investigation after the successful investigations against Fujimori, you said like there was a success, but what that was the moment, you know, what is this dangerous moment where either things are undone or the things are moving the wrong way because you said like you have a great transitional president right after. And what was that moment that things just went differently? First of all, corruption always fight back, always. So you cannot 
achieve some good result on the fight against corruption and then sit down and rest. No, you need to continue fighting because corruption is always fighting back. There's a phenomenon called re-corruption. And this is when corruption comes back and it comes worse than the first time you fought it. It's like the country revolution, but with the Yes, corruption. exactly. In the Peruvian case, it is absolutely clear for me what happened. We achieved very good results with the anti-corruption process. The transitional president Paniagua was there for eight months. He did a fantastic job. Unfortunately, he decided to leave power. He was a Democrat. And then the new president, Mr. Toledo, who is now in prison in the United States for receiving $30 million from a Brazilian company to grant them a project, decided to stop all the political reforms and the anti-corruption process. During the transitional government, President Paniagua established a commission that made a diagnosis to try to explain to the Peruvians what happened during the past 10 years with Fujimori. And there was a report, very interesting report, with a lot of suggestions and a plan to move forward the country. When Toledo received this in a public uh, uh, ceremony, he said, okay, this is great, I will work on this. And then he opened a drawer, put it, and never more again in the five years he was president, he talked about it. And then, because he had 30 million of reasons to stop the anti-corruption process, he was uh, taking bribes from this company. So that's the moment when we stop and we start the reversal process. Until now, that the scandal of Lava Jato has generated such a big impact in the country that citizens again reacted like in 2000 and said, no, no, what's happening here? We went through this film 10 years ago. <laughs> Why are we again in this situation? And now there's all this new political dynamic that uh, apparently is moving in, in a positive way. So thanks a lot for the talk. And uh, it was like about a more phenomenon of the corruption, but I really hope that it makes it more clear for the Ukrainians that there is a long way forward and could be a good way forward. You're welcome. Thank you.